a dangerous ritual tries to get safe, one of the earliest modern vampire legends strikes fear across Europe, and then we take a look at a case of a man walking through the woods alone. And when something unusual happens to him, does he meet a ghost, or does he enter an alternate reality? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. Day three of Vampire Week. Episode 3 of recording it in a day. I've recorded 3 episodes in a single day before. Never recorded 4, so we'll see how these next 2 go. This one I should be fine on. I just took about a half hour break, opened up the windows, got some fresh air. Cracked open a Diet a root beer. Should be ready to go here. Let's go ahead and get started with our first story. Now for our first story, we are traveling. Let's take the rabbit rowboat. We haven't used that thing in a while. Let's hop in the rabbit rowboat. We are going to row all the way from Hood River, Oregon to Spain. Simple trip. People do it all the time. You take an oar. I take an oar. Let's start rowing. We're going to be so yoked by the time we're done. Just super muscular. Just one side of our body, though. I've been using a walking stick to get around. I kind of ditched the crutches. My foot's still injured. Been using a walking stick to get around. And I swear my left shoulder is just getting bulked out. Because the stick, I found it. The stick itself has to weigh like 10, 15 pounds. Ah, that might be an exaggeration. I'd say probably between 5 and 10 pounds. And um, just walking for like a mile with it is really working out. And I can't like switch arms because the injury is on my left side. So we'll see <laughs> what monstrosity I end up becoming. But anyways, we're going to row all the way to Spain. So we go around South America. I almost said South Africa. Caught myself. We're going to go around South America, travel up to Spain. We're going to a place called Motel Alpino. Motel Alpino. This is one of those towns that does the running with the bulls. Might be the only town. I'm not for sure. But anyways, bulls. I thought Madrid did running with the bulls. But anyways, this town either also does running with the bulls or is the only place it does running with the bulls. You're like, Jason, just do your research. We're walking around Spain. We're wrestling each other. No, wrestling each other. We're using our strong arms to win arm wrestling contests going over the top. We're in Spain. Now, they recently have said, listen, guys, the running with the bulls is inhumane to the bulls because we make all these bulls run down a hill. They hate it, apparently. Even though we can't talk to them, I'm sure they love it. I'm sure they look forward to it every year because they get to gore (laughs) slow people and they get to run. What animal doesn't like running? I mean, a snail. Or a fish. Or anything being pursued by a lion. But animals just love running. But anyways, they said animals don't like it. They don't want to run around. They want to be like kept in a cage or something like that. So I guess there's probably an in-between between imprisoning them, making them run down a hill. Anyways, the point is, is that the city goes, it's inhumane to the bulls. So, But people still like running down hills. So we still want to have something. So some marketing exec, some genius comes up with the idea... What if we just change one letter? And they're like, rumming with the bulls? And they're like, no, 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 no. That's the wrong letter. What if we change the bulls to balls? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? He's like, hold on, hold on. Pulls out his pie chart. That's a Venn diagram. Here's the people who love running. Here's the people who are afraid of balls. (laughs) So there's an intersection there, and they're like, yeah, that is a pretty good intersection. Who isn't afraid of bulls? So the city decides to have a running of the bulls, and they've been doing it for a while now. Here's the thing. So it's not like you're running down a hill, and they're, like, throwing marbles after you. It's not like you're running down a hill, and they're just throwing bouncing balls after you. They made a foam ball. So you're like, oh, that's pretty dope. You know, I can outrun a a ball of foam. It's nine feet tall. So nine feet in circumference would be a better way to put it, since it's a ball. You're like, uh, it's kind of big for a giant ball of foam. It weighs 600 pounds. So, yes, it is made of foam, and that's cool. But if it hits you, it's not going to be like, oh, you want to take a nap. It will kill you. It will do serious damage. And it's the same thing. You get on the top of the hill, and they roll this ball after you. It has a painting of a bull's head on it, and you run down the hill, and this ball's coming after you. And... It's funny because they thought about the first one. They said, hey, maybe we should give everyone a helmet. And the organizer said, "Eh, no, because if we give them a helmet, 
then people will think, well, I can just get hit by the ball on the head and it'll be fine. It looks like someone's rolling a styrofoam ball after you. There's a lot of video footage of this thing. So if they go, if we give them a helmet, they'll think the helmet can actually protect them from this thing, and it won't. We don't want to give them helmets because it will kill them if they stop. And they're actually told at the beginning of the race, this is a quote, if there is no escape, that's what you always want to hear before you get involved in any sort of sport or game. If there is no escape, that is a reality. If there is no escape, it's better to lie down and let the ball run over you. Okay, guys, let's go. Woo! And you're like, whoa, whoa, can you repeat that? The problem is, is that people do think, oh, it's a giant foam ball, and they're running, and they're like, oh, I'm tired, I can't run any further. Now, if there were bulls chasing them, they know that if they stop, they're going to get gored or trampled. There's a real threat with the bull. But people see the foam ball coming, and they're like, oh, I'm tired, I'll just let it hit me. People have been putting <laughs> comas from this thing. This one guy had to get airlifted out. He suffered massive brain damage. That one is on video, unfortunately. I saw that one. He just stood there, and the ball hit him, and then the ball keeps going down the hill, and he's just laying on the ground. Like, it smashed into him. One guy had a bunch of ribs. He wasn't eating ribs. He's like, mm, delicious. The ball rolls past him. He had broken ribs. So, yeah, it's funny, because they're trying to make it less inhumane for the bulls and they did that because they're not involved at all anymore but now it's actually more dangerous for the humans because they don't perceive a threat and i know you guys are thinking well they're stupid for standing in front of a giant ball in the first place but again i think if you saw if you saw a giant ball of cotton candy rolling down a hill you'd be like "Mm, this is delicious if it you wouldn't realize that it weighed a ton like a ton of cotton candy is still a ton of something hitting you and it does look like just a giant foam ball At one point, it hit a barricade and exploded halfway through the race. And I think, again, that made people think, oh, it's just nothing. But it can kill you. And now they're thinking about putting, like, rubberized bumpers on the wall or something like that. But it doesn't matter. I think they're going to have to either cancel it or go back to... You know what they should do? They should do running of the breeze, where people just run down the hill, and you have giant fans at the top of the hill, and you just try to beat the wind. That'll be the safest way to do it. I wouldn't do it anyways. I wouldn't do it if I... I just don't like running at all or down a hill or being pursued by anything. But running of the bulls. If you ever want to go to Spain, that's what you're up to now. So let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Now, our next story is part of Vampire Week. Vampire Week was inspired by a list of emails I got from Mason Nordbeck. He's a Patreon supporter. I've been talking to that. He's uh, He's been listening to the show for a long time. I've exchanged a ton of emails with that dude. He's a good guy. But he sent me all these vampire stories. Now, this is a story that I discovered while I was perusing his vampire stories. He didn't specifically inspire this one, but he inspired the week overall. So thank you, Mason, for giving this week that I have to record in one day some structure. We're going to hop back in the rabbit rowboat. And apparently, we're going to hope that there is a river leading from Spain to Serbia. Otherwise, we're going to have to pick the rowboat up and carry it over land. Just w- Actually, no, we'll do that because that way we'll lift it with our opposing arm and get that one strong as well. So by the time we get to Serbia, we're just these hulking figures walking into town. And along the walk, we also went through a time tunnel and we ended up in the year 1725. We're headed to the t- Tell me this town doesn't sound like a Care Bear. Tell me this town doesn't sound like a name of an 80s cartoon. We're headed to... It's a village, actually, but we're going to Serbia. We go to the village... Of Kissy Lava. Kissy Lava. Wasn't there a, a show called Kissy Fur or something like that? There was like a little animated bear dancing around. It was like a Teddy Repskin ripoff or something like that. Kissy Fur. But anyways, this is Kissy Lava. That is, that's adorable. That is a town that you just kind of want to go and propose in. But not back then. Not back in 1725. <laughs> it was a horrible place to live in. Austrian Empire. Turks. Weren't getting along. Or they were. I'm not really good <laughs> on ancient European history. But... There, the land, Serbia was being traded off between rival empires, and Austria finally takes control of it, and they say, hey, we're going to put out a bunch of dudes and women, because we don't just want dudes out there. We're going to make a bunch of people, go. we're going to offer a bunch of people land out in the middle of Serbia, so they start farming there, so we can, like, have a claim to it. And eventually, this, like, the land keep did keep changing hands between these empires, but it, it was kind of like a village that sprung up, apparently. There could be European history experts you're pulling hair out right now i could be totally off on that but from my notes that's what i gathered in kissy lava there was a dude named pitar plogojowitz plogo i think i had it right the first time plogojowitz pitar or peter we'll call him peter 
this is easier. So Peter, he's like, that's not my name. My mom named me Pitar. And I was like, listen, you're not going to want that name in 300 years. It sounds ridiculous. He's like, okay, fine. And then he goes, how'd you guys get so buff? And we were like, oh, we had a rowboat. And we show, we do a training montage. He's like working out in the rowboat and then he's carrying it around. And then we're like jumping all in the air at the same time, freeze frame. So anyways, Peter is all swole up like us now, but it doesn't help him because at 65, he passes away. He passes away because he was just working out too hard. His heart gave out. And we're like looking at each other. We're like, "Uh oh, is that going to happen to us? Peter dies. Three days later, his son's sitting at home, just chilling, watching watching Netflix because they don't have anything. It's like, son's at home. He's doing absolutely nothing. And he hears a knock on the door. He's like, that's weird. It sounds like someone's just knocking on a table. That didn't sound like someone knocking on a door. He goes and gets the door. It's his dad. He's like, dad, you look so good. You put on so much muscle mass in the past couple of weeks. He's like, I was working out. And then the son goes, wait a second. You died three days ago. And Peter goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. About that. I'm hungry. You got anything for me to eat? And the son goes, uh, yeah, sure. I got like some beans and sprouts and carrots and stuff like that. Cause we're peasants in 1725 Serbia. Dad's like, that's all I ever wanted. So he goes to eat some peas, beans, whatever, whatever they have back then, and leaves. Now, the son tells everyone in town the next day, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> Townspeople are just t- silent. They're like, we have no imagination. We're peasants in 1725. Everything is stuff we don't believe can happen. And the son's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, just, I'm on board with you on that. My dad showed up at my house last night. And ate food. He came to my house and asked if I had food. And I gave him some food. The townspeople are like, that's terrifying. That's absolutely horrifying. And the son's like, I know. I'm afraid he's going to come back tonight. So, son stays up all night. Has a little meal set up. Has a little mixed bean, three bean salad. Some dip. Dad doesn't show up. The son's like, aw. He eats the beans. Goes to bed. But the next night, dad shows back up at the house. And says, son... I'm hungry again. Can I eat some more of your delicious beans? And the son, for whatever reason, says, No, Dad, I'm not going to feed you tonight. And the next morning, they found the son's body. So, let me step back from the story here for a second. That story is almost considered a separate fable to the main story. And it kind of makes sense, because how would they know what the final conversation was if his body was found the next day? From a skeptic's viewpoint, that doesn't make sense. We wouldn't know what they discussed. It would just be, dad shows up one night, eats some food. Dad doesn't show up the second night. Third night, the kid's dead. Like, you wouldn't know if he showed up or not. Like, there's no one to tell that story the body's dead. But anyway, so that story is kind of seems to be added on to the main story. The main story is this. I like that little prologue, though. What happens is, is that Peter does die. That's a historical record. I'm sure he had a son. I'm sure they just didn't make that part up. But anyways, he dies. And... People in town start getting sick, like deathly sick, like they're going to die. And they would say on their deathbed, they'd be like, Come here, come here, son. I want to tell you a story. They're like, oh, cool. You want to tell me about Kissy Lover and the Magical Rainbow Adventure? And he's like, no. The other night, the night I got sick, son, I was sleeping in my bedroom, and and a man walked in, and it was Peter. He wasn't just a no. He wasn't a dude. It wasn't my grinder request. It was it was Peter. And it sounds like grinder request, like stone grinder. And he's like, yeah, yeah. I requested some stones to be grinded because I'm a peasant, and that guy comes late at night too. But no, it wasn't that. It was Peter. That guy had been dead already, and he'd come into my house late at night. And he strangled me. And then I woke up. I thought it was a horrible dream. And then I got super sick. And now I'm dead. And the family would be like, oh no. And other people in town would be like, come here, daughter. I'm not going to do the story again. But other people in town were falling sick as well. And they would say on their deathbed, I was sleeping. Peter came into my bedroom and strangled me. And I woke up and everything was fine until I became deathly ill. Within eight days of the first sighting of Peter walking around town strangling people, nine people die. So this isn't like, oh no, this guy got some like wasting disease. He got the consumption and a bunch of other old timey diseases and he dies after six months. Like people are getting sick and dying in a very, very short amount of time. 
People are flipping. Oh, and there's another weird segue. Apparently, he's going around. He's strangling people. Is a dead man. And then he goes to his. He's already been to his son's house asking for food. He goes to his wife's house. Revenant walking through the village. Spooky fog everywhere. Knocks on his wife's door. Wife opens the door and he goes, Where are my shoes? <laughs> Where are my shoes? Where are my shoes? And that story is repeated in almost every version of the Peter story. Like the story about the sun feeding appears in some of the versions I've read. But all of them say that one night he knocked on his wife's door, asked for his shoes. We don't know if she gave him the shoes, which I'm kind of curious about. Like, why not just give the guy his shoes? What we do know is he came to the house and said, I want my my shoes. And she moved away. She left town, which seems like a bit of an overreaction. Like, just give him his shoes and then just stay in town. But she leaves town. So the wife just bounces out. He's like, my shoes. She was the only one who had my shoes. He's just walking around barefoot everywhere. That's why he's strangling people. He's like, maybe someone else has my size of shoes. They'll be buried in them. I guess he could just steal them. I mean, he's a vampire. But anyways, so the townspeople are freaking out at this point. They're like, he's a vampire. This guy's a vampire. Now, vampires weren't really well known in Western Europe at this time. It was considered this old peasant myth. The stories of vampires went back centuries, but it was just considered like this real bumpkin thing. Even in Eastern Europe, it was something that the hillbillies of Europe believed it. And there was a dude, he was the he was the Imperial Provisor Frumbald. Frumbald, what a horrible name. And I don't know if that's his first name or his last name. He's always referred to as Imperial Provisor Frumbald. So anyways, Frumbald is in town. He's taking care of business <laughs> every day, taking care of business. They're like, someone's like, picks up the phone. He's like, hey, hey, Bachman Turner Overdrive. You want that new sound? Listen to this. And the guy's like singing it. And then he realized phones haven't been invented. He's just talking to a banana, which aren't even in Eastern Europe. But anyways, anyways, the guy's totally just a lunatic. So anyways, the guy's taking care of business every day. And the townspeople say, hey, listen, man, you got to do something about this vampire, dude. Like, he's killing all these people. Now, Frumbold is like, that's not true. There's no such thing as vampires. They don't exist. But if they do exist, what you're asking me to do is to disinter a body and do some voodoo on it. And I don't have the authority to do that. Like, I have to get permission from my bosses to, to, to desecrate the dead. That's totally ridiculous. And the townspeople said, okay, dude, you have a choice. Because again, it's not like you could just pick up the phone. They had to send like messengers on horseback and they had to like outrun wolves and stuff like that. It would take months to get this message. Townspeople said, listen, either you go with us to disinter the body because we don't want to do it by ourselves or we're all going to leave town. And from bald, that's the reason why the people are there in the first place. They're trying to take back the land. Fine, I'll do it. So from bald actually goes and ropes a priest into it. They go to the guy's grave and they dig it up. And that's when we get the classic idea of like disinterring a corpse and finding the traces of a vampire. They said he was undecomposed, which technically I think the term is composed. But they find his body and it's totally fine. He has a beard. He has new skin and nails. His fingernails are a bit longer. And he has blood on his mouth. And the townspeople at this point, they're not scared anymore. They're outraged that there's vampires in their town. Someone gets a stake. They put it right through his heart. And they said fresh blood comes out of his mouth and his ears. And then they're like, okay, this is super gross. They pull the body out. They burn it. Now, this story got picked up by newspapers in Western Europe. And it was just kind of like, look at these crazy bumpkins. They believe in vampires. What a bunch of yokels. And it started what's known as the 18th century vampire controversy. Because even though the original thing was, these people are stupid, it exploded in Western Europe. And all of a sudden you had like all of these learned people who were all about the Age of Enlightenment afraid that vampires were real. Now, there was one other story in Serbia that took place about 10 years earlier. A guy named Arnold Powell, which is kind of a similar story. I thought this story was more interesting. It's kind of the same, along the same lines, though. But so those two stories, separated by about a decade, being reported in the media, it caused people all over Europe to really believe that vampires are real. And they say that a lot of the legends we have of vampires, specifically the fact that you could open up the grave and see that they're still fresh and they look young, and you got to stake them and all that stuff, come from those old Serbian legends, specifically those stories. And what's weird is, as I was looking into this, there is actually another practice that involved it. Because I thought... 
what's the logical reason why blood's coming out of this guy's mouth? Like I thought, I don't think they're making that detail up. What could actually cause that? There is a thing called Purge Fluid, which is the name of my new punk rock band. Purge Fluid is basically all of the, it's not necessarily blood, but it can be easily mistaken for blood. It's pus and goo and, and some blood, a bunch of other disgusting stuff. And when you press on bodies, it pops out. And the fingernail is getting longer. It's because your skin starts to get tiny. Same thing with the beard. Your, it doesn't get tiny. Your skin doesn't become like a little munchkin. But it gets tight on the skin. So beard follicles will pop out. Your nails will get longer and stuff like that. But anyways, this whole thing with purge fluid, they actually used to use that to tell if people were murdered. Well, they knew they were murdered because they had stab wounds in them. But they had it for hundreds of years from like the 6th century to like the 18th century. They had this thing where if they found a dead body that they thought was murdered, they would make the murderer touch it. And if purge fluid, if the body started bleeding again, that means he was the murderer. And sometimes they would test it where one person would touch the body and then nothing would happen. And then another guy would walk up and touch the body and it's all... A bunch of stuff comes out. And King James, the guy who wrote the Bible, he didn't write the Bible, but King James, famous for having the King James translation of the Bible, he said that it was God's way of supernaturally pointing out a murderer. Instead of just like a lightning bolt coming out of the sky and frying the guy, they knew it shouldn't happen. If you had a body, there should be no fresh blood in it. But if you had a body and a murderer touched it it would bleed. So it's weird because it was a known phenomenon at the time, but it was only attributed to murder victims. So the fact that you had someone who died just because of old age or just getting sick, also bleeding at the mouth, they had to go, well, he wasn't murdered, so he must be a vampire. But really, though, Arnold Powell, that story, and then this Peter Blojovowicz, they really started what we know of the vampire legends because that really all just kind of came from Europe. Very, very interesting story. Was he a vampire, though? I mean, forgetting the the purge fluid stuff, why were the people having that dream of him coming in? Or was it a dream? Was it Okay, it probably was a dream, but it's just interesting these people were having these encounters with this spirit, at the very least, or vampire, at the very most, and then them dying in a very short order. To lose nine people in eight days is quite a lot. And most importantly, which I, my question is, why was he just asking the sun for food? Why wasn't he drinking from the sun? Was the sun lying? Was the sun actually providing him with like lamb blood or something like that? And they're like, your dad came to eat a three bean salad. And he's like, yeah, three bean salad. And he really has a bunch of sheep guts in his yard. Bizarre. But yeah, that's really where a lot of those legends come from. 18th century vampire controversy. That is also a great name for a band. This is the band name episode. Let's go ahead and move on to our last story here. Now, last up story is one of those stories that is one person, single witness, never been documented again. So he's either making it up, someone else made it up on his behalf, real event that he misinterpreted, or it's true. Let's take a look at this story here. Very super vague, super vague story. 50 years ago, that's all the information we have. I don't know when the article was written. This is from a website called Supernatural Magazine, which surprisingly is not about the hit show Supernatural. That show's ending. That's crazy. I should catch up on that. I should catch up on the eight seasons I haven't watched. I don't know if it's like season 14 or something like that. Supernatural Magazine. 50 years ago, there was an unnamed man. <laughs> there was an unnamed man walking through Wisconsin. So super vague. Super vague. Now, the guy who's writing the article says that he had a friend tell him this story. And he goes, I didn't want to reveal this guy's name. And that's why I think he goes, it's a forest between here and here. I think he didn't want to give any details that could possibly identify this person. But supposedly, this is a really remote forest in Wisconsin. So this dude is walking through the forest, right? He's hunting. He has his rifle, chilling, birds chirping, <laughs> blowing him out of the sky. He's like, oh, wait, no, I'm not I'm here to hunt deer. I shouldn't just shoot everything. <laughs> shoots a rabbit and he's like oh yeah i'm not hunting rabbit either he's walking through the forest and he sees a stump he goes i'm going to sit on that stump i'm going to put my rump on that stump like a dr seuss character and look at this lump and he sits down on the stump and as he thinks of good ump he puts his rifle on his lap that's not that's never in a dr seuss book should be though it'd be awesome you just have a guy walking around whoville he's like i have to clean up the streets to clean up these streets of Whoville. So anyways, so anyways, anyways, anyways so uh, Dr. Seuss here is sitting on this lump. <laughs> Damn it, he's sitting on a stump. Dr. Seuss is sitting on a stump with his rifle, right? 
And what was weird, I should have said this detail earlier before I got into that stupid thing. He's walking through, the Dr. Seuss is walking through the woods. He sees this stump. I'm backing up that far. And next to the stump was a four feet plank of wood. And he goes, that's weird. Because he was in a remote area. He's not on a trail. He's hunting deer. He's not walking around hikers. He sees a stump that's perfect for sitting. And he sees a four foot plank sitting next to it. He goes, that's bizarre. Someone must have been here before me in the middle of nowhere. Not unusual, but unlikely. So he sits down next to the stump and he's thinking about stuff. He's thinking about his plans against Whoville. And then he hears a BAM! And he flies off the stump. He said he fell back several feet. And he just lands on his back. And he's he's in shock. And he goes, the first thing I did was check myself for wounds. He goes, I thought that somebody had shot me. So he's laying on, and he started feeling around his chest, looking for... I've done that too. Like, when I lived in bad neighborhoods, whenever I heard gunfire... I have this thing where I look at each of my hands. I look at each of my feet. I look. This is what happens when you grow up in bad neighborhoods. You have to do stupid garbage like this. I'd hear a gunshot. Because a lot of times you can get shot, you won't even know it. I look at my hands. I look at my feet. I look at my shirt, my chest. And then I close one eye, and then I close the other eye. And I go, okay, I'm not shot. That's what happens when you spend 30 years in the ghetto. That's what happens. You just build weird survival technique things like that. Because you can easily just be like, oh, that was cool. And then you just bleed out. Because you're in shock. You got a bullet right through the eyeball or something like that. So, anyways, he does the same thing. He starts feeling around his body. He's not shot. He realizes he's not shot. Then he thinks, maybe my own rifle went off. Because the sound was so close. So he checks his rifle. No bullet has been discharged. Packs his gear up, gets out of the forest. Now, he tells his friend, the guy who's writing for Supernatural Magazine, do you know what this could be? And the guy who wrote for Supernatural Magazine said, he he had two theories. One of them I didn't really get. Well, I I got it. I just didn't really buy into it. But one of them was that it could have been, this is an interesting one, a ghost reenactment. So, what he may have been going through was basically reliving a haunting. Imagine that someone had been there before. Because someone had been there before. They found the plank of wood. Guy goes out, sits on the stump. He is killed there. He is shot and killed there. And his psychic energy remains in that lonely, dark forest. Day and night, day and night, day and night. For who knows how long. And then one day a guy comes and he sits where that man sat. And the haunting replays itself. There's a couple questions with that. One, does that haunting play itself? Like, is that bang? Do you hear that bang every once in a while? The haunting play itself out? We would never know because it's such a remote part of the forest. Does it require a trigger? Does it require another hunter to be there for it to play itself out? Does sometimes a rabbit hop on the stump and just fly across the forest? He's like, oh, what the hell happened to me? Checking his, checking his little paws. No, no, I'm fine. And, and then his other theory had to do with like spirit wolves or Bigfoot or something like that. Like it was some sort of, I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really pay attention to it. I read a couple of paragraphs and I was like, yeah, this, I don't believe in that. But, but... Then I came up with my own theory, which is, I think the ghost one's probably the most likely one. This one's interesting, too. We've talked about quantum realities before, where people die in one reality and they just shift into the next one. What if he was sitting on that stump in his reality and really did get shot and flies off the back of the stump and died, but he came into our reality where he didn't die? The idea of quantum immortality is whenever you die, you simply, you can't perceive a universe you can't perceive. So whenever you die, you shift to a universe where that didn't happen. And then you're like, that was a close one. I almost got crushed by that elevator, but I didn't. I jumped out just in time. And then I saved my girlfriend from the evil terrorists. And we got in a helicopter, flew away, credits started rolling. Like you can't experience a reality where you can't experience anything. So that's the idea behind quantum immortality. So that could have been the case too. He could have been sitting there taking a stray slug right through the chest and then flew backwards. And in that action... Entered a reality where he didn't, where he had avoided that fate. I think it's a little more comforting because it's that thing. Like, people don't really die. They just kind of continue experiencing things in their own way. I always think that's kind of an interesting way to look at death. You may mourn the loss of that person, but that person has moved, like, that person has moved on to another... That person doesn't even know they're dead, is what I'm saying. They're continuing to live their life, which I just find quite comforting, rather than thinking they're in some ethereal dimension where... Any, like, there's no time or gravity or anything like that. Like, that's way more trippy than thinking, oh, no, no, that dude just went to another reality 
and he ate it. He had, see, he's having Slurpees right now. He's totally fine. So, but I think the creepier version is the ghost one. Because not only is it creepy that a guy could trigger a haunting like that, but I fi- I've talked about this several times on the show. I find the absence of humanity terrifying. I'm very pro-human. I'm very pro-civilization. And sure, yeah, you can walk up a mountain, look around, and be like, oh, that's kind of cool. There's a valley and a bunch of trees and some frogs and stuff jumping around. But I don't like to be in places where there aren't humans. It's weird because I'm actually quite an introvert. Like, I like being by myself in in a city. I never want to be by myself in the middle of nowhere. That's absolutely terrifying to me. Not being, not knowing there are other humans or not knowing there is civilization around me. When I play Minecraft, When I play Minecraft, the first thing I do is find a village. I can't play a Minecraft game where I'm sitting in the middle and there's no one around me. Like, I need to know that there are people in the... And then they all get slaughtered. I always make some horrible decision and the village is destroyed by creepers or pillagers or something like that. But there has to be a village. I don't even like playing the game until I... I'll go row... I've rowed a boat for it like 45 minutes once trying to find a village. So, yeah... The idea of a spooky, <laughs> let me get back to the story here, and not my, that was embarrassing. Uh, let me get back to the story here. So, the idea of the woods is creepy. The idea of haunted woods is even more creepy. But the idea of, like, knowing right now, you're sitting at home, you're at work, you're driving in your car, and somewhere out there in the vast wilderness of the world, there's a haunting happening that nobody can even see. Because it's just like, Phew! Every so often, just in the woods. Like, let's say he didn't trigger it. Just every so often, in the woods, in the middle of the day. (sighs) Birds go back to chirping. Deer walk by. That's terrifying to me. A haunted house is less scary than almost just a mindless haunting experience in the middle of nowhere. But getting violently thrown off a log is quite dangerous. There's a chance it wasn't just the residual haunting. There's a chance that it wasn't an alternate universe. There's a chance that something happened there. Some sort of ghostly or even demonic presence in that remote wilderness of Wisconsin. That wasn't a playback of a previous experience, but an introduction of a new one. It's quite possible he could have been thrown off that stump, hit his head, and laid there in the bushes until he slowly died. No one would have found him. He was in the middle of nowhere. And whatever caused that event in the first place got its own trophy. A new ghost to walk the woods. A decomposing body in the middle of nowhere. A missing hunter. And now you have two entities in that forest. Waiting however long it takes for someone else to take a seat on that stump. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.